five verses. It, it makes it a little easier than the ones that have four verses. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 20. It seems like a very long time since we were in the book of Acts. Last time we were in Acts was actually August 23rd. Then August 30 was the fifth Sunday special, the search for the Ark of the Covenant. Then September 6 was missionary to Chile, Reverend Jim Buer. That was set up about five or six months ago for him to be with us as the last uh, speaking obligation before he went back to Chile. And then on the 13th, I was on my third trip down to Alabama, out of town on that uh, Sunday for the installation of Judy's gravestone. So it's been a while. August 23rd that we were here in Ephesians, excuse me, Acts chapter 20, looking at farewell to Ephesus. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me there, we're in Ephesus, uh, Acts chapter 20. I'm going to get that out yet. We are studying the Ephesian elders, but Acts chapter 20, and uh, we are looking at the verses 13 through 38. Acts 20, 13 through 38. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us in Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, and sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos, and tarried at Tregilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to, the, to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in unto you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this moving section of the book of Acts. It reminds us that the Apostle Paul was not a little machine 
running around and spitting out Bible verses, but he was a person who loved and was well loved by those to whom he ministered. We thank you, Father, for his testimony. We thank you for his concern for the church. We thank you for the supernatural insight that you gave him, even among men who were godly men, that they still had old sin natures. They still would do things that were wrong, as do all of us. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the going forth of your word tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've noted in the past two messages that this passage can be approached in at least seven different ways. It's good for us to remember that because we are having to sort of mix and mingle these ways as we go through the passage. But we're also taking some sections and dealing with them straight doctrinally, just that one particular issue. But the seven ways that it can be approached can be approached historically. That is how divine intersections of life produce lasting results. And we see some divine intersections here as Paul calls for and they come, the elders of Ephesus. It can be approached prophetically things that Paul foretold, some of which apply universally to the church. And we're going to be talking about some of those things prophetically tonight uh, as he is forecasting what these men whom he himself has appointed will do after he departs. It can be approached doctrinally, and we're going to see some of the key doctrines tonight, especially in the area of leadership that the Apostle Paul makes reference to here in the passage. They can approach personally the cost of serving in ministry, both to those who minister and to those who receive ministry. We've dealt with that already. It can be approached as a study of the impelling will of God. Paul knew that he had to do. He had to go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit told him so, even though all the prophets along the way said bad things are going to happen when you get there. It can be approached as a guide for finishing the end of a ministry and the end of a life. It's very good on that. That will be one of our last messages, perhaps next week on this passage, a guide for finishing the end of a ministry and finishing the end of a life. Are you ready? We talked about being ready this morning. My question, you say you're a Christian, so how has it changed your life? If there's no fruit in your life, it's proof, says Paul, that you are not saved because the Holy Spirit always transforms our lives. We'll still sin. But there is progress in the right direction as God the Spirit begins to work in our hearts and conform us to the image of Christ. And finally, it can be approached as a crash course instructing church leadership. And we'll be getting into some of that tonight uh, as we look at the doctrinal and prophetic sections of this passage. Now, what we've learned so far, Paul had a vow on him. We learned back in chapter 18 that Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem to be at Pentecost so he could fulfill his Nazarite vow. And we saw that in Acts 18.18. 18. We saw the insurrection that was made in Acts 18.12 and following, uh, where they were claiming that Paul was persuading people to worship God in a way that was illegal, and yet Paul himself was obeying the law perfectly to fulfill a vow which he had made under the law. Now, last time in part three, we saw that church leaders are supposed to teach everything that is profitable, but to major on the majors. In this text that we just read here a moment ago, there are five majors that are listed. Number one, repentance. Number two, faith. Number three, the gospel. Number four, grace. And number five, the kingdom of God. You'll see those in verses 20, 21, 24, and 25. Those five things are listed for us in those verses. Paul says, when I was out there preaching among you, those are the things I emphasized. I emphasized repentance, which means he preached against sin. <laughs> well, when we think about preaching repentance, just remember what that means is listing specific sins and telling people, if you're doing this, you need to repent. You need to confess it. You need to get it right with God, but you need to stop doing it. Repentance is the first thing that he preached. The second thing that he preached, he says, and I preached faith. Verse 21, testifying both of the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's called a calculative chi, and it, it joins those two things that you can't separate them. You have to have both of them. 
There's an easy, easy believism that's floating around out there today that just says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, but it never changes your life. Genuine repentance means a turnabout, 180 degree turnabout, the word is metanoia, and it means to you're going east, you head west, you're going north, you head south. It's a total change of life. But, he says, it's not just a matter of changing what you're doing, there has to be faith involved. And there is a specific object of your faith, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that when the Apostle Paul refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't just talk about him as Jesus. He talks about him as the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are people who are out there teaching lordship salvation, that if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I don't think that's what Paul is teaching here. But Jesus should be, in practical terms, the Lord of your life. In theological terms, he is the Lord of your life. But in practical terms, he should be the Lord of your life in every aspect of your being. No matter what you're doing, no matter what sphere of influence you're walking in, he should be the Lord controlling everything that you do. You should always submit your will to his will. Don't be stubborn. Don't be recalcitrant. Don't be obstinate. But say, you are Lord. What do you want me to do? Here am I, Lord. Send me, as Isaiah the prophet said. Paul, when he was sitting around in darkness, in blindness, waiting for something to happen, Lord, what will you have me to do? Not just what will you have me to believe, what will you have me to do? The Christian life is not a matter of theory. The Christian life is walking by faith, doing the will of God, not merely believing the will of God. So we find repentance, then we find faith, and those, of course, are very important to us. But then he talks about the gospel. We have an obligation to communicate the gospel. Now, I got a little book that was handed to me, oh, maybe a week and a half ago, and it says, What is the Gospel? And I was just glancing through it, haven't had time to read it yet. It's about 75, 80 pages long. Uh, and it is amazing, the author is going through all these different things that people claim to be the Gospel, and he cites the different sources where those are. If there's that much confusion in the evangelical community about what the Gospel is, we are in sad trouble. The gospel, that means the good news, is not what you can do, but what Christ has done. Some people say the gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. No, that's a response to the gospel. There's a difference between the gospel itself and a response to the gospel. The gospel is, and Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is the good news of what God has done, not what you can do or what you ought to do. The gospel is that Jesus died for you, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the good news. You can't pay for your sins, you can't work your way to heaven. There's nothing that you can do. All your works are filthy rags, as the book of Isaiah tells us. We are all undone, we are all unclean, but Jesus paid for our sins. The gospel centers on who Jesus is and what he did. The gospel centers on the fact that Christ died for our sins, but that wouldn't help us if Jesus isn't God, because only God can forgive sins. So the gospel is the third thing. Grace is the next thing. I'm afraid that many in our circles, in Reformed circles, tend to emphasize law, but they fail to emphasize grace. Now, the proclamation of law is important because it brings us under conviction of sin. Law shows us the righteous holiness of God. And it shows us the filthy, stinking sinfulness of man. You must proclaim that there is a holy God, that men are sinners, that they are lost. When you compare God's standards with man's standards, man fails every time. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. A schoolmaster was the one who had the authority to beat the students. <laughs> and that's what the law does. It beats you. The law beats you and beats you and beats you until you come running to Christ for grace. 
You're not saved by the law. You're not sanctified by the law. But you are saved by the grace of God. You are sanctified by the grace of God because of what Christ has done. And so he preached unto them grace. Then he goes on and he says, I've gone also preaching the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God relates to the millennium. And we talked about that, well, three times ago, whatever week that was. That was so far ago. But we talked about the kingdom of God and its relationship to the millennium. And in the context, Paul is talking to them about how to live the Christian life in view of, big theological term, eschatology. What should we be doing to live the Christian life in light of the fact that Jesus could come back at any moment. John expounds on that in 1 John. He tells us that every man that hath this hope, that is the blessed hope, the imminent return of Christ, every man that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. When you really understand that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment, that Jesus Christ could come back tonight as we are here in this auditorium and I hope all of us would go up at the rapture I hope there's nobody left sitting here wondering what happened to the rest of us if you really believe that it will change the way in which you live it will change the way in which you talk it will change the way in which you think it will change your attitudes it will change your motives why are you doing what you are doing he went preaching the kingdom of God Jesus is coming the millennial kingdom is coming we're going to be going to heaven one of these days, folks, and it could be tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready? Those are the key doctrines that the Apostle Paul reminds them that he had been preaching. And so, of course, he calls the elders of the church. They come to him, and he says, From the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner, of man what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility, of mind with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Then he says in verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He preached those five main areas of theology, but he didn't leave anything out. So the second lesson we learn is in our sharing of the gospel, sharing the scriptures with others, be consistent and be transparent. If you're doing it right, you don't have to change your lifestyle or your doctrine. Now, it's very foolish to preach that Jesus could come back at any minute and then be living out there like a wild pagan, drunk all the time and doing all kinds of horrible things. That's hypocrisy. We need to be consistent. We need to be transparent. Number three, we need to preach content, that is, preach the word, realizing that sometimes you'll receive specific direction where to preach and where not to preach. Paul was specifically told not to go to Asia when we had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Content didn't change, but location changed. God may give you an assignment one day, which is over in Philadelphia. Like, has he called any of you to go witness to the Pope? <laughs> Somebody raise their hand, yes. Okay, do it. Where has he called you to go? What has he called you to do? What is the context in which you live? You live in a different context than everybody else sitting in the pews around you tonight. You have different opportunities. You have different contexts. There are different people that are going to have questions about what you believe because of the way in which you live. Those are the people God has called you to reach. Number four, preach in light of the imminent return of Christ. Preach in light of the imminent return of Christ. Preaches a dying man, preaches to dying men. Imagine yourself on a lifeboat out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you've been for days without water and without food, and you're a Christian, and all the other people in the lifeboat are lost and headed for hell. You know some of them are nasty, you know some of them are mean. Do you sit there and say nothing to them? Or do you realize that soon you'll slip into heaven and they will slip into hell? We're going to talk about that more tonight because there are two chapters in the book of Ezekiel that Paul makes reference to in his text here that tell us their blood will be on our hands if we don't share Christ 
with them. Would you do it? Suppose you'd be afraid of them beating you up or throwing you to the sharks. Hey, look, you're going to die anyway. Wouldn't it be better to share Christ and let the Holy Spirit take the Word of God and transform their lives? The imminent return of Christ is one of the most powerful motivators both for proclaiming the gospel and for living the Christian life. Now, new material tonight. Number one, you will be held accountable for not preaching all the counsel of God. Don't be afraid of offending people. You're going to be held accountable for it. And we will, every time we proclaim the good news of Christ, we will offend people. Now, most of us have offensive personalities. I know I do. But that's not what should offend them. If they are offended, let it be at the cross of Christ. But we have to proclaim the cross. We have to proclaim the resurrection. You know, the, temper, uh, the temptation to compromise is very great. Even the prophets of the Old Testament faced it. But Paul says in verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He majored on the majors, but he didn't leave anything out. He communicated all the counsel of God. What was the need at the moment for that particular group of people to whom he was preaching? He made sure that he covered that topic. If he knew it, and certainly the Holy Spirit let Paul know because Paul had prophetic gifts, he didn't leave out anything that was needed for his audience. You know, I've discovered many times uh, over the years that sometimes I'll be preaching a message and I get prompted to stick something in. I did that this morning. And uh, stuff that I hadn't written down. You know, I manuscript all my sermons. And sometimes afterwards, someone will come up to me and say, you know, what you said, and they'll talk about what I added that wasn't in my notes. That is what I needed today. God directs our steps. The steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We can count on God to give us direction when we are seeking to walk in the center of his will. Let me read you about one prophet who was tempted to compromise and not to speak because he was facing some nasty, mean people. Jeremiah chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Amnon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Here's predestination, folks. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I set you apart. And I ordained thee a prophet of the nations. Here's a brand new baby getting ordained to be a prophet. It wasn't his choice. Then said I, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. Now, he was a full-grown adult man, but he was scared stiff. He said, man, I don't know anything. What in the world am I going to say? I'm like a little kid. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child. Don't make excuses. You know, as you go through Scripture, it's interesting to see how many people God called who made excuses and didn't want to go. For example, Moses. God calls Moses, says, I want you to go back to Pharaoh. Moses had just run away. I want you to go back to Pharaoh and talk to Pharaoh. But, 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 Lord, I got gets to speak. I, 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 I stutter, st 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 stutter, and, and I can't, 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 can't talk. God said, well, that's a crummy excuse, Moses. Who made man's tongue? Do you not think I can control your tongue and tell you what to speak? You know, we make excuses to not do what God wants us to do. But you know, none of our excuses hold water. Jeremiah is trying to make an excuse here. Hey, I, I can't do this. I'm, you know, I don't know anything. I'm like a little kid. And God says, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. Did you know we've been given a command? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We can't even talk to our neighbors across the fence. We'll all be giving an account someday. Ah, oh, but Jeremiah goes on. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now, verse 8. Here was his temptation. This is why he, why he wanted to compromise, why he wanted to give up. Why Paul says, you know, don't give up, and I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul had plenty of opposition. We've seen that all the way through the book of Acts. But Paul did it because God said to do it. God says to Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces. They get hard faces. They begin to squint their eyes. Their teeth begin to clench. Their fists begin to clench. They begin to snort and they begin to move in his direction. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Is God bigger than the ugly faces that you have to look at who don't like what you're saying? Is God bigger? I think you'd say yes to that. I hope you would. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. God has given us his word. If you're faithful, you're reading it. If you're faithful, you're studying it. If you're faithful, you're memorizing it. If you're faithful, you are meditating upon it. God has put his words in your mouth. Are you speaking them? See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. The rubbish has to be removed first before you can build and plant. You know part of our responsibility? is to warn the wicked that judgment is coming. Now, Paul has specifically alluded to two different chapters out of the book of Ezekiel, which we mentioned just a moment ago. Paul says, I am pure from the blood of all men, because I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I wonder if when we stand before Christ, all of us will be able to say we are pure from the blood of all men because we have not shunned to declare all the counsel of God. We're going to look at what is called a transdispensational principle here tonight, something that extends through the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. There are a lot of things like that in Scripture. Not everything, for example, we're no longer under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. You can eat pork if you would like to eat pork. You can eat shellfish if you would like to eat shellfish. Uh, that's made very clear in Acts chapter 10. All those unclean things that were unclean in the Old Testament by ritual purification standards, Peter <laughs> sees them in the sheath that's being let down from heaven. And God himself says to Peter, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And later we find the Apostle Paul making the statement, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Those are things that don't move from one dispensation to another. But some things do. No matter where you are, whether you're under the law or under grace, you'll find that there are some things that transfer across. We're going to look at one of those tonight. And Paul is alluding here to Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. Verses 26 and 27 of Acts 20. Wherefore, I take you to record this day. Put it down. Write it down. I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, did you know that Ezekiel, that's Old Testament. That's 597 B.C. Ezekiel went in the second deportation to Babylon. Three different deportations. 605 B.C., 597, 586. Three times Nebuchadnezzar came and sacked the city of Jerusalem. On that last occasion, he actually burned the city down to the ground. 
The first time he took all the nobles and the princes. The second time he took the upper class. Third time he took many of the poor, ruined the city, and then scattered the people. Ezekiel 597. 597 years, almost 600 years before Christ. Ezekiel tells us that we will be held responsible for the blood of those who die in their sins if we don't warn them. That's what Paul is repeating here in Acts. He's citing Ezekiel. In other words, the principle applies to the age of grace as well as under the law. Now, I know the doctrine of election, and I believe it strongly, that only the elect will be saved. But there also is the doctrine of personal responsibility. And that's clearly taught in Scripture. You can't just say, well, you know, if God is predestined, it, it'll happen. No, God has given each one of us responsibility and obligation. And that's what Paul is rehearsing here to the Ephesian elders. I did the job God called me to do. Now, I know he's sovereign and he'll do what he wants to do with it. But my job is to obey. My job is to proclaim the gospel. My job is to teach you all the counsel of God. My, gospel is to, my, my responsibility is to teach you about repentance and about faith and about grace. And then God takes it and uses it because his word does not return void. It accomplishes that which it pleases and it prospers in the thing whereto he has sent it. You don't know why he sent it or why he sent it by you, but you know that it will prosper because it is the word of God. If we could just learn that, just learn to obey happily. You know, ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do and die like the uh, charge of the light brigade. Our responsibility is simply obey God and let him take care of the results. There is human responsibility. Now, question each one of us will have to face someday. How many people have died in their sins because we failed to warn them? Let me read you what Ezekiel says. I'm going to read you some verses out of chapter 3. And then 30 chapters later, he says the same thing again. This is Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16. It came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, and by the way, uh, it's interesting to me, that phrase, the word of the Lord, came unto me, it's he came unto me. It's not just there was a bingo in his head, boing, like a telephone call, and God sort of spoke into his ear. It says the word of the Lord came unto me. The scripture makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the word. You will find that all over the Old Testament, several thousand times, the word of the Lord, he said. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord told me. Jesus is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word was made flesh, John 1.14 and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, of grace and truth. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, interesting, that is Jesus' favorite term for himself, is the Son of man. His favorite term for himself in the Gospels, if you read through, is not Son of God, it's Son of man. He's emphasizing his real humanity. And God calls Ezekiel also son of man. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Now get the last phrase. But his blood will I require at thine hand. That's spoken to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's a pretty powerful prophet. God says, if you don't warn him, he will die in his iniquity. But I'll require his blood at your hand. How many people have died in their sins because we didn't warn them? We had the opportunity. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. 
Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. The righteous sin too. We see some of them in our text tonight. Some of the elders who defect. Some of the elders who decide to walk in the flesh. Some of the elders who try to pull people out underneath them. He talks about those who come in from the outside like wolves, but he talks about those who rise up in their midst. When a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, because God sees it and God will make him trip, he shall die. God always chastens his own. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. Get that last phrase. But his blood will I require at thine hand. We have an obligation not only to the pagans, not only to the unsaved people, not only to the lost people who are out there, to warn them about their wicked ways. And if we do and they don't repent, then they die in their sins and we're okay. But if we don't warn them, God requires their blood at our hands. But he says the same thing about believers, about righteous men. And we see them involved in sin and we fail to warn them about their sin. And God chastens them and he can chasten even unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall even pray for it, says James. God will require their blood at our hand. That's what Paul is making reference to here. Paul had a very great burden, a very great sense of the urgency of the hour of telling people the truth. Are we just sort of lackadaisically sliding through life, letting things pass by as ho-hum and ho-hum? Do we not have a sense of urgency that all around us people are dying and going to hell? Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, this isn't Ezekiel making that up. He said, after seven days, the word of the Lord came to me and he said, this is what you must do. Let me take you down to chapter 33. Ezekiel 33, beginning in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Makes sense, doesn't it? Imagine yourself in World War II London, and you hear the sirens go off, and you know that the Nazis are about to bomb London. It happened over and over and over again. And you say, you know, I'm really tired of listening to those sirens. I'm busy doing something else. I'm having fun. I think I'll just keep on having fun. Now, the sirens warned you. And if you don't take shelter and the bomb falls, what do you expect? But God is telling Ezekiel, they didn't have sirens, but they had men with trumpets. And the trumpeters were, were out there on the, on the edge of the city or on the edge of the horizon where they could see that the army of the enemy was coming in. And as soon as they saw the glint of the light on the shields and the spears, they would blow the trumpet. The enemy is coming. Get ready. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Verse 6. But if the watchman see the sword come, you know it's coming. Your people look around you in the United States. Is it coming? Is judgment going to come on this land because of the sins that it is wallowing in right now? If the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, 
but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. It's like capital punishment, capital crime, to fail to warn when the enemy comes in like a flood. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. You can't use the excuse, well, you know, God said he would tell them. Well, after all, they got the Bible. You know, they got a Bible. They can read it for themselves. God says, I'll tell them. But if you don't tell them, his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. It's particularly important to notice to whom Paul is speaking. Now, those principles apply to all of us because all of us have opportunity to warn the wicked. But he's talking to the church leaders. He's talking to the elders. When he makes this reference back to Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33. Church leaders have a responsibility of warning and of standing and not being afraid. Like Jeremiah trembled in his boots, but God said, you'd better do what I tell you to do. Otherwise, you are in serious trouble. He's warning them about what happens when an elder defects from the biblical qualifications. That's the warning Paul is giving to them, but he's also quoting a passage that reminds them of the warning that they're supposed to be giving to others as well. These are the men whom the Apostle Paul himself had appointed at Ephesus. They were leading a solid, fundamental church that was known for its sound doctrine. We see that in the book of Revelation where the letter to the church at Ephesus says, yeah, I know you all. You're, you guys are great theologically. You got it together when it comes to systematic theology, when you've got, you got historical theology, when you've got practical theology. You've got it all. You know your stuff. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. They had mechanized their scripture study. They had it down very efficiently. They could go to their little Stone Age computers and um, pop things up, you know. They knew all the answers to all the heretics. But they had lost their love for Christ. It's not just enough to be a good, sound, doctrinal church because even there, wickedness can creep in. This is a church known for its sound doctrine. One of the most doctrinally mature epistles in the New Testament was written to Ephesus. Well, where the church is strong, remember, Satan always mounts his most vicious attacks. There are 23 biblical qualifications. We're not going to get through this tonight. I can see it's already 10 after. But let me just give you an overview. There are 23 biblical qualifications for elders in Scripture, and there are 17 biblical qualifications for deacons. You can actually imply more from the context of the two major passages where it tells us the qualifications for elders. For example, a willingness to confront false teachings and false accusers. That's not stated as one of the things, but it's implied by what Paul says as he writes both to Timothy and Titus. There are 23 that are definitive slated. The two key passages are 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And in uh, 1 Timothy, he speaks about the bishop. That's uh, a word that means an overseer. That is a word that is used of the elders when he's writing to Timothy. And then he talks about the elders in Titus, and we see a very parallel list, although a few additional qualifications are found in the book of Titus that are not listed when Paul writes to Timothy. Let me just read it through for you quickly and I'll number them and then I'll read the Titus passage because we won't be, have time to really discuss these tonight. Hope to finish it up to next week. 
First Timothy chapter three, verse one is where I'm starting. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, that is an overseer, one who is an elder in the church, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be number one, blameless. It doesn't say sinless, it says blameless. We'll talk about that later. Number two, the husband of one wife. Number three, vigilant. Number four, sober. Number five, of good behavior. Number six, given to hospitality. That is very hospitable, likes to have people into his house. Number seven, apt or skilled at teaching. Number eight, not given to wine. Number nine, no striker. Number 10, not greedy of filthy lucre. Number 11, patient. Number 12, not a brawler. Number 13, not covetous. Number 14, one that ruleth well his own house. Number 15, having his children in subjection with all gravity. By the way, you notice that three of these qualifications that we've listed so far, numbers 2, 14, and 15, all relate to family. And these are the only qualifications that are extensively expanded on in the list. In verse 5, that's very highly significant. Uh, verse number 5 says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, number 16 and 17, which we'll see in just a second, also have shorter commentary on them, but the one that gets the big commentary is a threefold thing that relates to family. Verse 6, number 16, not a novice. And here's your short commentary, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Number 17 and verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, and here's your short commentary, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, none of those qualifications are optional. You can't just say, well, you know, this guy's got five of them. And he's better than the guy that's got four, so let's elect the guy that has five. To ignore any one or more biblical qualifications is to put the church in jeopardy. Even when men meet all these qualifications, they can still fall into sin that disqualifies them from church leadership. That happened at Ephesus. Those were men that Paul knew were qualified. And some of them defected after Paul left. Paul lists additional qualifications in Titus, and of course many of these are the same as in 1 Timothy. So I'm going to give the number of, that I assigned to it back in Timothy as I read this Titus passage through. And you'll see that it sort of bounces around. It's not in the same order, although the first couple are in the same order. But then it bounces around because it picks up some of the later ones that modify the ones that he just said. For this cause, this is Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Fascinating there, too. It wasn't popular election. It was by choice of a mature seasoned leader. Verse 6, if anyone be one, blameless. That was the number one, you recall, back there in Timothy. Number two, the husband of one wife. That was also number two back in Timothy. Then he jumps to number 15. Number 15 in 1 Timothy 4 was having children in subjection with all gravity. Here is having faithful children not accused of right or unruly. Verse 7 of Titus chapter 1, for bishop must be blameless. He restates number 1. That was number 1 in 1 Timothy. It's number 1 in Titus, and it's restated here in verse 7. Then he goes to number 9, as the steward of God. Then he adds a new one. Verse, this is what we would count as number 18. Not self-will. That's not listed over there in, in 1 Timothy, but it's listed here. Then he adds another new one. This is number 19. Not soon angry. Then he jumps back to what was number eight in 1 Timothy, not given to wine. Then he goes to number nine, which is also number nine in 1 Timothy, no striker. Number 10 out of 1 Timothy, not given to filthy lucre. Then he jumps back to number six, but a lover of hospitality. Then he gives us another new one. So this is number 20 in the list, a lover of good men. Then he jumps back to what was number four in the 1 Timothy passage, sober. Then he gives another new one, number 21 just, that's important, righteous. Then he gives another new one. This is number 22, holy. Then he gives another new one, temperate. We're down to verse 9 now in Titus chapter 1. Then he goes back to what was number 7 in the first Timothy list. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. That's the teacher. And then he gives some reasons why. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, 
Notice the Jews gave Paul a lot of problems every place he went. He mentions that over and over again in that commentary on how bad the Jews treated Paul. And Paul says how they had laid in wait for him and so on in this speech to the Ephesian elders. He says, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. In other words, you've got to be willing to confront. Now, nobody likes to confront. I mean, none of the Old Testament prophets like to confront. And God said, you've got to confront. And so they confronted. They confronted not on the basis of what they wanted, but on the basis of what God wanted. They spoke the truth. They spoke it many times in fear. But God said, be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee. whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. There are plenty of those around today. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. That means lazy gluttons. This witness is true. I wonder if we look around ourselves today here in the United States if we see anybody that we could say lazy glutton. <laughs> I am astounded as I look around. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that's confrontation, that they may be sound in the faith. What you believe changes your life, doesn't it? Those kinds of things wouldn't happen if they believed sound doctrine. The word of God is transformational. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. A lot of people talk the walk, talk, but don't walk the walk. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Remember Paul gave that warning? He said, I have not failed to declare unto you the whole counsel of God, everything, and that makes me pure from the blood of all men. Remember Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 33. I hope you can remember that. Those are easy numbers to remember. They're 30 chapters apart. 3 and 33. 3 and 33. Let's say it together. 3 and 33. Say it again. 3 and 33. What book? Ezekiel. We have a responsibility, and particularly church leaders, but many of you are church leaders. You have responsibilities in Sunday school. You have responsibilities in vacation Bible school. Many of you have responsibilities in your employment. You say, well, you can't, can't, can't mix my, my, my theology with, uh, with my work. Uh, I would, you know, uh, Jesus is Lord of my life when I'm inside the four walls of the church. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? all the time be not afraid of their faces for I am with thee that's what God told Jeremiah and someday we'll have the parade of people go past us that died in their sins we failed to warn them we won't be able to say at that point oh well they weren't among God's elect anyway the question is, did we do what God told us to do? Did we obey? Paul, with a clear conscience, could say that he was clean from the blood of all men because he had declared all the counsel of God. I pray that when we stand before Christ, we'll be able to say the same thing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for what we've studied tonight, and we pray that it will be a challenge to us we tend to float through the Christian life and have everything sort of going along easy with no confrontations, no conflicts, and we sort of avoid that kind of stuff. We sort of sneak around the corner. We sort of blend into the background. We sort of fade into the shadows. But you've told us, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And our Jerusalem starts with our next door neighbors starts maybe with somebody in our own family, maybe even in our own house. 
Help us, Father, not to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.